Okay, uh, I guess we can start. Uh, excuse me for wearing the mask today. I was involved in a traffic accident last night and got uh, seven stitches still on my face, so <laughs> try not to scare you, but uh, I'm fine, I'm fine. Uh, uh, it's not COVID, so <laughs> don't, don't worry. Okay. Uh, so w hello everyone, welcome to 130B Quantum Mechanics. So today we are going to continue our discussion of angular momentum. Uh, last time we have started talking about angular momentum. In quantum mechanics, every physical observable gets promoted to an operator. The same happens to angular momentum. In classical physics, angular momentum is a vector which has three components. And the direction of the vector denotes the direction along which the body is rotating. And the amplitude of the vector is the momentum associated with the rotation. But in quantum mechanics, these three components gets promoted into three observables or operators, Hermitian operators, J1, J2, and J3, such that the total angular momentum as a vector is J. So these three components uh, as the operators, they satisfy the commutation relation. And this is the most important relationship that defines angular momentum. And this definition applies to both the orbital angular momentum and the spin angular momentum as special cases. We also mentioned that uh, starting from the angular momentum operator, one can write down a new operator, which is basically the square, uh, sum of the square of the components. And this operator is special in the case, in the sense that it commutes with any one of these uh, angular momentum components. So this is another Hermitian operator that commutes with everyone. And, and this is also called Kashmir operator and plays an important role in the following discussion. So the idea basically is to choose a maximally set of commuting observables and use them, their eigenvalues or eigenvectors to classify all the possible states in the Hilbert space. But, but in order to do that, we also need to introduce some other op uh, operators like J, J plus and J minus which uh, does not commute with those maximally commuting observable. Uh, by maximally commuting observable, I mean this J square and J3. Because J square commutes with any uh, component of J, uh, so uh, it's uh, usually a convention that people typically choose J3, such that J square and J3 are two commuting observables. If you have two commuting operator, both are Hermitian, then you can say that the Hilbert space of the system all the basis states can be classified by the joint eigenstate of these two observables, uh, J square and J3. But if we choose J square and J3 as uh, uh, the commuting observables, then the observable that does not commute with J3 correspond to J1 and J2, which can be then combined into J plus or J minus, which are Hermitian conjugate to each other such that they satisfy certain algebraic relations. These algebraic relation basically allows us to rewrite expression in terms of J1 and J2 fully in terms of J square and J3. And we will see that this will give us a lot of uh, uh, simplification and allows us to do quantum bootstrap in the end. So through last time's derivation, we, I think uh, uh, you can check that there is some uh, algebraic relation that can be verified. And in the end of the derivation is an uh, equation like that. It tells us if we perform the J plus operator L times followed by J minus operator L times or vice versa, what we'll should be the corresponding uh, operator in terms of J square and J3. And then this plus minus sign uh, correlated in this expression, meaning that if you take the minus sign here and plus sign here, then you need also need to take the plus sign here, okay? <clears throat> okay, so given this, so this equation basically is two equations, uh, okay? So with that, last time we started talking about towards the very end, quantum bootstrap. We will use this method again to, uh, to construct the whole angular momentum eigenbasis. So the idea is that we first identify that J square and J3 are two observables that uh, operators that commute with each other. So we can think that they have some joint eigenstates, meaning that there are some eigenstates which you apply J square, it gives the eigenvalue times the state, apply J3 gives the eigenvalue times the state. 
The po this is only possible if the two observables or two operators commute with each other. Because if they were not commuting with each other, then this is a contradiction. Because you can first apply J square and then apply J3. Then you get uh, this number multiplying the state and this number multiplying the state. But because these two uh, eigenvalues are numbers, so it doesn't matter if you change the order of applying J square and J3. So if J square and J3 will not commute, you would say that the, uh, the two different ways of applying them will lead to different outcome. But if on the other hand, you also say that they have shared common eigenstates, then that's an inconsistency because the fact that they share a common eigenstate means that if you apply them in different orders, it is just getting out these uh, uh, eigenvalues in different orders, which are numbers which commute. So the fact that the two Hermitian operators can have common eigenstates necessary requires that the two operators commute with each other. And within these set of angular momentum operators, J squared and J3 are the largest set of uh, commuting observables. So we will stick to that. And then you may notice that these eigenstates are labeled by two, uh, uh, let's say, indices, J and M. So at this moment, J and M doesn't have clear physical meaning. J is just the index that labels the eigenvalues of J square, and M is the index that labels eigenvalues of J, J3. For now, we don't know what should be the feasible region of uh, J, uh, lambda J and lambda M, what should be these eigenvalues. But we will determine them very quickly. The um, principle to determine these eigenvalues is to use the quantum bootstrap method, which essentially imposes the positivity constraint. It says that when you apply any operator on a state, this gives you a new state. But if you take that state and it's cat, this is a cat state, take its broad dual state, and then take the scalar product between the state with itself, it must be greater or equal than zero. So that means this O dagger O operator sandwiched between the same state must always be greater or equal than zero. Given that uh, very general principle, we can take very special cases. So in this special case, we consider O operator, which is this O, to be uh, a sequence of operator which is given by uh, the so-called raising or lowering operator to the Lth power. And then, uh, that, then this uh, positivity constraint essentially requires that for any chosen L, where L is a natural number, it goes from 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So any of these expression must be greater or equal than 0. But on the other hand, we are able to evaluate this scalar product because we have a formula which tells us how to uh, rewrite this uh, raising and lowering operator in terms of fully in terms of J square and J3. But when J square and J3 acts on these uh, states, and this state has been previously assumed to be the eigenstate of J square and J3, so what happens is that it basically gives you the eigenvalues. So the whole thing evaluates to these eigenvalues, although these eigenvalues were combined and then product together in a very complicated form, but nevertheless, it's just some numbers uh, product together. And this product involves an integer k, which goes from 0 to l minus 1, where l is fixed by the power l here. So for every chosen L, we have a, a, like a series of things product together where these Ks are natural numbers, OK? So that means we actually need to solve a series of inequalities because the positivity constraint now becomes that all these numbers or these products must be greater or equal than 0. So let's take a look at what these products uh, is like. So for example, maybe let me put the formula still there. So uh, when L equals 0, when L equals 0, then K cannot product from 0 to L equals 0, then the upper limit is L minus 1 minus 1, right? So there is no such a product. When there is no such a product to do, then the default value for product is actually 1. For example, the default value for sum is actually 0. If there is nothing to sum, then the result is 0. If nothing to two times together, then the result is 1. So basically, it tells you that 1 is greater or equal than 0. And that is completely uh, useless, because that's always true. But the non-trivial constraint comes from when L equals 1, 2, and so on. 
So when L equals 1, then k can take value 0. When k takes value 0, and there's only one such a term in the product, so the whole product reduces to lambda j minus lambda m plus k, where k is 0, and lambda m plus minus k plus 1. But now k, k plus 1 is 1, so we put a 1 here. So basically, that's the, uh, that's the inequality. So, uh, so what does this inequality look like? Uh, it basically is telling us that lambda j must be greater or equal than the quadratic function of lambda m. Maybe I draw it here. Lambda, lambda j must be greater or equal than lambda m times lambda m plus minus 1. So, so if you draw an axis, for example, this is lambda m, and then this is lambda j, then lambda j greater or equal than lambda m times lambda m plus 1. So for this quadratic function, it has two roots. One root is at lambda m equals 0. The other root is at lambda m equals either plus 1 or minus 1. So the two, so the two quadratic function basically looks like a parabola that goes that, like that. So this is 0. This is 1. This is minus 1, right? So, so this curve on the right basically correspond to lambda m times lambda m minus 1, because that's the two roots. And the two roots determines the curve. And then the left-hand side, on the left side, this curve is lambda m times lambda m plus 1. And by saying lambda j must be greater or equal than uh, both of the curve, meaning that lambda j can only live in the area above both of the curves, right? So in order to satisfy this inequality, you need to live within this parabola, but also live within that parabola. It's a, there's an end relation <laughs> between these two constraints. Everyone can see that? So this, uh, this basically tells us uh, what's the region of this uh, feasible region. So I have a, a, like a demonstration here. So in this demonstration, you can tune this uh, so-called L maximum. L maximum is the maximum L that we consider within this series of inequalities. So if we set L maximum to 1, meaning that we will consider these inequalities up to L equals 1. And as we see, when we choose L equals 1, this inequality basically tells us that uh, uh, lambda j, which is a vertical axis with respect to lambda m, must be constrained in such a region that the region is specified by uh, the, the intersection of these two curves, basically, uh, in the upper region. Okay? So that's what this constraint tells us. And then we will continue to apply higher and higher order constraints that goes to L equals 2 and so on. So for those constraints, unfortunately, it doesn't have such a simple geometric picture because the function there is more complicated. So we have to rely on Mathematica to <laughs> calculate them. For example, when lambda, uh, when L equals 2, it will put new constraints on this uh, originally existing uh, feasible region. So this feasible region, when we draw the boundaries, that means the whole boundary is also actually feasible. And not only that, the, these uh, points, which is along this curve, and also these isolated points are also feasible, meaning that allowed by the inequality. So again, we see that although we are considering inequalities, usually when we think about inequality, it gives us constraint about regions, about continuous regions. But uh, interestingly, in this quantum bootstrap approach, both in the previous harmonic oscillator case and in the angular momentum case here, we see that applying, progressively applying higher and higher order inequality constraints actually shrinks the continuous region and actually leads to the emergence of these discrete uh, solutions of the set of inequalities. And if we go to higher order L, we will see there's more points uh, uh, like uh, emerging, and then the connection between the points gets cut because they were no longer uh, allowed by the new inequalities, turns out. They will be ruled out by the new inequality. As you add more and more inequality, 
you will see that uh, a lattice gradually emerges uh, from, uh, from, from this picture. So when I go to L equals, when I consider all the inequality up to, up to L equals eight, I can at least guarantee that within these uh, lowest values of lambda m and lambda j, so you can see I'm plotting everything surrounding the origin, so this discrete solution will start to emerge from the origin and spread out through the whole upper region, which was previously in this feasible region. So this feasible region is you only consider one uh, inequality, it's like a continuous region, but if you consider many of them, you will find that uh, there's a discreteness that is uh, emerging. And if you look at these pictures, what are the possible value for lambda m? For example, in this point, that means lambda m equals zero and lambda j equals zero. But these two points correspond to lambda m equals uh, one over uh, one half and minus one half. And the corresponding lambda j, I think, is a three quarter and so on. So basically, they are arranged in such a lattice. And then uh, maybe the, the rule for lambda j is still not very clear because sometimes <laughs> this lambda j value is not an integer. But nevertheless, if you look at lambda m, its uh, rules is very clear. All the lambda m's are arranged on a, uh, 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 that uh, can only take values of either integers, you can see either integers or half integers, like this, this line is half integer, okay? This is also half integer. Okay, so that's what we uh, obtained by solving these uh, uh, inequalities. So the magic is that the solution, amazing thing, is solution is discrete, angular momentum is quantized, and uh, they are described by two uh, set of eigenvalues, one for the J-square operator, the other for the J3 operator. The eigenvalue for J-square operator actually is labeled by a quantum number J, which uh, if you study that uh, lattice more carefully, you will figure out that it actually corresponds to J times J plus one. And then for J equals zero, one half. So let me, uh, let me just mention that. So J goes like, this line, the bottom line is j equals zero, and the corresponding lambda j is also zero. This line is j equals one, but that doesn't mean lambda j is one. Lambda j is related by this, uh, so sorry, this line is j equals one half, but lambda j is related to j by j times j plus one. So one half times one half plus one is actually three quarter, as I said there. So you can see this lambda j is indeed three quarter. What about one? So when j equals one, one times two is two, right? So you can see lambda j is two. So lambda j is two actually corresponds to j equals one. So it turns out, although lambda j doesn't sound like something that has equal spacing, you can see that the spacing lambda j is actually increasing, but uh, the, the j quantum number actually has an equal spacing that goes from zero, one half, one, and three half, and so on. All the integers and half integers. And this m value, uh, lambda m, has a very nice uh, relation with m. It's uh, directly related to the m quantum number. And the m quantum number basically go from minus j to j, as you can see here. So this j and m quantum number are also indices that emerge from the solution. Because from the solution, we can only got the solution of lambda j and lambda m. It is just for our convenience that we create this quantum number j and m, which are integers, and take these very special values, that it happens that if you take this uh, kind of uh, integer solution, and then uh, with these constraints, like m must al always go from minus j to j, then you can faithfully reproduce all the lattice point that we see in this diagram. So b based on that, you, we say that the solution <laughs> basically is like that. So, so it's not like we magically solve something and we find this deri or derive this equation. It is like we apply all the inequalities and find this lattice and we found, and later on we found that the lattice can happen to be described by all these rules. And these rules, uh, to, in order to describe these rules, we create uh, this notion of uh, quantum numbers, J and M. So their meaning is only clear at this point. So for orbital angular momentum, it turns out J always take integer values, but for spin angular momentum, J can also take half integer values. 
And then in the end, uh, these two equations basically means we can rewrite our eigen equation as j squared acting on the eigen state is eigenvalue. Now eigenvalue is j times j plus one. Uh, 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 multiplying the same state, and J3 is the same eigenvalue, which is M, multiplying the same state, okay? So th those are the eigen equations of J squared and J3. Any questions? <coughs> okay, very good. So now we have understand how to represent uh, J squared and J3 on this set of eigen basis. So the eigen basis will now, eigen or eigen state, will abstractly be denoted or labeled by the quantum number which emerge from our calculation, which are this J and M. So we already understand if we apply J squared and J3 on this eigenstate, what happens? But what remains to be understand is when we apply this J plus or J minus, the raising and lowering operator, on this eigenstate, what will happen? And as the name indicates that this lowering and raising operator was supposed to raise and lower the quantum number of M, actually, not J, actually of M. The raising and lowering operator will never change the J quantum number because J quantum number is related to the observable J square. And we know that J square commutes with every component of the angular momentum, including the raising and lowering operator because uh, uh, it commutes with j, j plus minus, so j plus minus can't change its uh, eigenvalue, it can't take a state from one uh, j state to another j state. It can only change the quantum number m. And it is indeed the case because when we apply the previously, I think we derive an equation which tells us if we commute this j plus minus through j3, what happens is actually nothing happened to j plus minus, but j3 gets uh, increase or decrease by one. But that basically means that if you try to consider this J plus minus acting on JM as a quantum, as a, as a state, and then you try to evaluate whether this state is an eigenstate of J3, you will find it is indeed an eigenstate of J3, but with a different eigenvalue, which is given by M plus or minus one. So this tells us that if you apply J plus minus uh, to this uh, JM uh, eigenstate, it will give you a new state where the new state is uh, uh, labeled, should be labeled by J, <laughs> the same quantum number J, but the M quantum number will get increased or decreased by one depending on whether you choose the plus or minus sign here in the raising or lowering operator. <laughs> Yes. Yes, that's a very good question. So uh, the question is because M is bounded somehow by uh, up to the positive J and uh, lower to the negative J. So there must be the case that at a certain point you can't further raise it. But if I write things like that, it seems that I can keep raising and lowering and that is not true. This is because we're only saying that this is just proportional to this state, but we forget about the proportionality constant. The proportionality constant will play a very important role when you touch the boundary. When you are at the boundary and try to raise it further, the proportionality constant will automatically become zero to prevent you from doing that illegal move. So, uh, so this, is the, this is the magic there. So we will, uh, it's just saying, but uh, we will see that uh, our next task is to compute this proportionality constant and uh, really see that uh, it has that kind of a safeguarding effect. So this proportionality constant, the way to compute that is to consider, let's consider this uh, expression again. We apply raising or lowering operator on the state and then scalar product with itself. Uh, well, when we scale a product with itself, we need to take uh, raising to lower, lower to raise, because they are Hermitian conjugate to each other. So anyway, applying this, on one hand, we can use equation 106, which, which is an equation which tells us how to replace this J plus minus, J minus plus product by the J square and J3. And then rem if you still remember the result, this should be J square here, and then this should be J3 uh, times J3 plus minus one. But then J squared hits this eigen say now we know what's the eigenvalue. The eigenvalue is J times J plus one, and J3 hits the eigen state. The eigenvalue is just M. So by replacing all the operator by their corresponding eigenvalues, we can evaluate this expression in this way, and then this is the result. 
But on the other hand, we say that this J plus minus acting on this state will give you a new state where the m quantum number raised or lower by one with the additional factor, where this factor has to do with J, M, and then whether you choose plus sign or minus sign. So it has to do with all of them. And then this factor will get squared uh, because we will have this factor from this side and also the same factor from the other side. And then, uh, so that means, uh, so that means, but we are evaluating the same expression on the left hand side. But on the right hand side, we have two results which uh, can only be true if this overall factor, if this normalization factor is square root of that. And how can we see that uh, it prevents us to do illegal things? For example, if our M is already touching the <laughs> ceiling, <laughs> which is J, when M equals J, you can see. When M equals J, then this is J, plus, J times J plus one minus M times M plus or minus one. So now if you start at M equals J and try to raise the M further, poking through the ceiling, <laughs> then this will <laughs> tells you, no, you can't do that. Because if you want to raise it further, you need to take the plus sign here. When you take the plus sign, m is already equal to j. So the two term is identical and cancel within this square root, and the coefficient goes to 0. And, and you can also check that. <laughs> it doesn't allow you to sink below the floor. So, uh, so, so that provides a, a, a very interesting mechanism mm -hmm. to, to restrict all the m quantum number within the feasible region. So here is a summary of what we have learned so far. We have said that uh, angular momentum operator, we define the angular momentum operator, and now we find a set of eigenbases. They are common eigenbases of J squared and J3 with these eigenvalues. Not only that, we also understand how to apply J plus minus on these eigenstates. And it just simply gives you a new eigenstate with M quantum number raised or lower by one. But don't forget about this coefficient because they are very important to prevent M from going out of bound. With all these uh, ideas, we can again uh, try to think about like a, a, a constructing all the states from a single state. Uh, maybe you still remember in the previous harmonic oscillator case when we talk about boson creation and annihilation, we say that all the boson number state can be created from the vacuum state by keep uh, creating bosons, right? So you just need to apply creation operator multiple times and you can reach any state in the uh, Fox state Hilbert space. It is the same idea here for the angular momentum. For example, you can start from the so-called lowest weight state. So don't worry about this word weight. Uh, it actually has nothing to do with the weight. So just it's a mathematical term. It just means the state that has the lowest possible m quantum number given the j quantum number. So which is j and the j, and j quantum number and m quantum number is minus j in that case. That's a lowest weight state. So the lowest weight state cannot be further lower, but it can be keep raising. So you can keep applying the raising operator on the so-called lowest weight state, and then if you raise it by, you can raise it all the way by j, like a j plus m times, and basically I think it gives you uh, something like uh, j and m. Uh, so so these, uh, all the j m state can be raised from the lowest weight state. It can also be lowered from the highest weight state. Highest weight state is the state which m is highest. And then you can keep applying the lowering operator to lower it to any j m state that uh, you, you want to target, okay? But these expressions are a bit co uh, complicated, so it's not required. I, I'm just showing you that there are these formulas. <laughs> if you are really <laughs> interesting, <laughs> interested in that, you can try to prove that these are, uh, these are the case. But why do I want to talk about this so complicated formula? Because I want to make a connection with, uh, with a harmonic oscillator. Although we saw that here, raising and lowering operator and angular momentum algebra look, doesn't look the same as harmonic oscillators, boson creation and annihilation, but actually there is a limit where they are equivalent. And the limit is the so-called large J limit. So in the limit that the J quantum number is large enough, and remember, J quantum number actually determines the lambda J eigenvalue, 
So when the j quantum number is very large, that means lambda j, which equals j times j plus one, is also very large. That means we are very high in the spectrum. When we are very high in the spectrum, these points are very dense. Basically, we have many, many of these possible states, m, spanning from minus j to plus j. And when j is very large, then this j is so large that it almost like 1,000. If you have uh, minus 1,000 to 1,000, then it's almost not different from taking all the integers, right? So uh, when j is large enough, uh, these uh, quantum states uh, basically can take, uh, uh, these m states can take all the integers, then that's very similar to the case of uh, boson numbers because boson number can also take all the positive integer, there's still a bound here. So if you shift your origin to here, then you treat this as a zero boson state. The, you treat the lowest weight state as zero boson state. This will be one boson, two boson, and three boson, and so on, because their spacing is also equal, just like when we count the boson numbers. So it is, uh, of course, you can also shift the origin to there and use the lowering operator. So you can call it, this is z zero boson, this one anti-boson, this two anti-boson, and three anti-boson. So you can have either particles or anti-particles if you look at the spectrum from, from the lowest weight state side or the highest weight state side. The point is that as long as J is large enough, you never see the things in the middle and you never touch the other uh, side of the spectrum. So if you just look at one side of the spectrum, it almost look like a boson. And that is just saying, but if you look at the expression and uh, finish all the computation, you can sh really show that. If you start from a state which goes like uh, j times uh, minus, minus j is the lowest weight state, and plus m means that I want to add n bosons, so-called bosons, on this lowest weight state. So that kind of state. And then if you raise it on that kind of state, it will really, n will get raised to n plus one with a prefactor. Previously, the prefactor is rather complicated, has, has, uh, has to do with something like a j times j plus one minus m, m times m plus one and square root. But if you substitute all this into the expression, you will find that, that, the, that, the, that the square root basically becomes n plus one. And this is the coefficient in, in immediately in front of the boson raising operator. Remember, if you apply a raising operator on the n particle state, you get n plus one particle state with a square root of n plus one. So this basically says that this raising operator of angular momentum is also the boson creation operator, but it's just need to be renormalized, renormalized by a, a square root of 2j kind of factor. So there is a correspondence when j is large enough that if you start from the lowest weight state and then deviate from that by, uh, by the m integer, m quantum number, if m quantum number deviate from minus j by n, this n can be treated as a boson number as well, counting the bosons, such that the raising and lowering operator really correspond to the creation and annihilation operator of the bosons, okay? So it is for this reason that this boson also has a name called the magnum in solid state physics, yeah. So we have learned, for example, uh, like a sound wave in quantum mechanics gets quantized to a particle, which is called a phonon, and the light wave gets quantized to photon, and then the spin wave, what is a spin wave? In a magnetic material, we have we, uh, materials made of electrons, and electron has spins, and sometimes this spin will align together in the same direction. But this is only in the ground state the spin favors, or the lowest temperature states, the spin favors to align altogether. If you raise the temperature, you can create fluctuation in these materials, where the spin can actually, you can tilt one spin, they are all aligned, but you tilt one, and this will affect the, its neighbors, and the neighbor will get tilt, and then affect its further neighbor, so, so, so spin will basically also form a certain kind of wave. And this kind of spin excitation or spin wave propagating in the material, also has a quanta, <laughs> also has a quantum mechanical particle, and then the name for it is called magnon. Magnon is also a boson, okay? So that arises from, from these ideas. <coughs> Any questions? Okay, let's briefly summarize uh, what we have learned. 
uh, we define angular momentum operator, most importantly defined by its commutation relation. This is just one way to write its commutation. And then we define the total angular momentum operator, also called so-called J square operator or Kashmir operator, the same thing. It commutes with all the components of angular momentum, define raising and lowering operator. And then by quantum bootstrap, we are able to solve and find all the eigenvalues of J square and J3. We are also able to determine uh, how does J plus minus acting on the states gives you the new states followed by some coefficient. And then there is a rule uh, when we solve all this inequality, it gives us a rule about what this J and M can take values. J can only take values of integers and half integers on the positive side, on the non-negative side, let's say. And M can only take uh, values from minus J to J. Uh, so when J is half integer, M is also half integer because if you start from a half integer, adding integers to that is not going to give you uh, integer value. So when j is half integer, all the m's within that j is also half integer. And if j is integer, then all the m within that, that j sector is also integer, OK? So that's uh, what we learned so far. And now, today, we are going to continue applying this and consider representation theory. Because in the above derivation, you can see we only use algebraic relations between these operators. And then this is, seems to be very abstract. Uh, a way to make it more concrete is really choose these spaces and represent all these operators as matrices. So that's what we are going to do now. Uh, that's what it's, I want to talk about, the representation theory. In the representation theory, we, uh, we are going to uh, consider, for example, examples first. So first of all, let's consider so-called spin one-half, which corresponds to the j equals one-half subspace. So you can see the, in this space, there are many, many states. There are almost infinite number of states. But uh, because the raising and lowering operator will only take you from uh, along the same line, right? It doesn't change the J sector. So if you're along a horizontal line, you're never get, get, getting off this line. So instead of talking about all the states in the Hilbert space, we can actually uh, partition the Hilbert space into different uh, sectors, which correspond to the J quantum number and then uh, only talk about the state within that uh, sector. For example, the simplest, uh, maybe the simplest sector is j equals zero, but that's too trivial because there's only one state there, which is uh, m also equal to zero. M has no choice. But when j equals one half, then m can take value plus or minus one half. So there are at least two states there. One is here, one is here, something like that, okay? So we are going to focus on this j equals one half sector, and there are only two states. And then the corresponding spin operator is also the Pauli matrices. You can show that this is indeed true. Because, uh, of course, previously we say that this gives you an angular momentum operator. But today, let's try to start from the very basic. And then let's show that, for example, if you start from this, uh, uh, if you define this 1 half and plus 1 half, as, uh, as the up spin state, and then one half and minus one half. The first one half is j quantum number, second one half is m quantum number. So you define these two different m quantum number as up and down. Then using the previous expression, you can actually show that, uh, did I have a show? Okay. I'm actually typing in the formula into Mathematica and use Mathematica to complete all the calculation. But the idea is that, idea is that based on these two bases, you can actually construct J3, for example. Uh, so the J3 here denoted as, as S3, uh, because S stands for spin. And then uh, uh, you can see it's two eigenvalue will correspond to the two M value, which is plus one half, which is this one, and the minus one half. The two eigenvalue will be arranged on the diagonal of this matrix, because S3 is an eigen operator of this eigen basis. But what about S1 and S2? Well, that can be constructed from uh, the uh, so-called S plus and S minus, similar to J plus and J minus. So by applying those uh, rules of how J raising and lowering operator acting on these uh, states, and further denote, uh, fur further remember that this J plus minus is J1 plus minus I J2. Uh, same for S. If you change everything to S, it's going to be the same. Okay. So as long as we know how to represent J S plus minus, we also know how to represent S1 and S2. 
And it's an exercise for you to figure out <laughs> this uh, S1 and S2 indeed uh, uh, take the form like this if you substitute everything into this formula, into this formula, okay? Any questions? So, uh, so it should be able to check, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, after checking, you can show that, okay, they are indeed Pauli matrices that we have talked about previously. So previously, when we talk about these Pauli matrices, we just give them without explaining. But today, we have learned that if you consider these Pauli matrices are associated with the spin operator of a spin one half a particle, then they really should take the form of, of uh, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z as the three components of the uh, spin angular momentum operator. And here, I just reiterate uh, the corresponding eigenstates and the eigenvalues, uh, which is not very important. Okay. <laughs> we can also go to the spin one subspace. Uh, in that subspace, we will have three states. Uh, the three states will all have j quantum number equals one, but the m quantum number will go from plus one, zero, and minus one. If we arrange our basis in this order, we can sh first of all, we can show that L3, L3 is now J3, uh, will, will look like that. Basically, all its diagonal will be uh, populated by the eigenvalue plus one, zero, and minus one. And L1 and L2 supposed to be a linear combination of L plus and L minus. L plus and L minus will try to raise and lower these uh, states. So if you plus them together or minus them together, you basically will give, you can derive, you can derive the L1 and L2 will look like that. So just using these uh, rules of applying these uh, raising, lowering, and J3 operator to all the states, you can represent all these operators, um, also J1 and J2, all these operators in, uh, in terms of matrices. So that's what we want to do. And then uh, these matrices turns out to have a relation uh, with another basis. So uh, we, we can see the way to represent these operators is not unique. For example, we can either represent L1, L2, L3 as these three matrices. If you don't uh, believe me, you can try to check that their commutation relation is indeed the, the relation that you expect for angular momentum. But someone come and tell you they can also represent L1, L2, L3 as these three matrices. These three matrices look so different from those three matrices that at the first glance, you may not be able to believe that they actually <laughs> correspond to the same algebraic relation. But if you really have the patient and sit down and check their commutation relation, you will find these three and these three <laughs> solution have identical <laughs> commutation relation. They all correspond to the angular momentum. So what's the, why there is such a difference? Because we can always perform basis transformation. Uh, for example, we can transform the previous basis, which is labeled by the m quantum number, to a new set of bases, which people call it x, y, and z. It is because the spin one particle is just like a P wave. Um, I don't know how to explain that, but <laughs> if you learn some atomic physics, you will know that electron will orbiting around the nucleus and form orbits. These atomic orbits are classified by their angular momentums. So when angular momentum is zero, that is called the S wave and it's spherical wave function. And when and the angular momentum is one, that corresponds to so-called P wave that has a dumbbell shape of a wave function. One part is plus, the other plus is minus, that kind of wave function. But because that wave function has a plurality that it has a plus and minus separated in the wave function, so it have, uh, you need to specify along which direction <laughs> this plus minus is going to split. And then uh, there are three different P wave, uh, wave functions, Px, Py, and <laughs> Py, and Pz, that correspond to three different ways of splitting the wave function. So although we haven't talked about anything about the wave function for now, but the, the fact that we can use L equals one angular momentum to label this wave function simply means that this wave function must have something to do with the, the so-called very abstract basis that we just obtained from quantum bootstrap. So this is some algebraic results obtained from bootstrap labeled by the M quantum number. And people actually study this, uh, uh, this problem and they figure out that these three bases are related to these three bases by a basis transformation. 
And this basis transformation turns out to be a unitary transformation as, as, as we expected. Any basis transformation is unitary. Under unitary transformation, operator transform in this way. So if you take this matrix, which is here, as U, and then you apply U dagger LU to the L here separately, you will find that the resulting <laughs> transformation result is all these three uh, matrices, okay? So, so that's just another different way of representing uh, L equals one angular momentum operator. The reason that I want to talk about angular momentum operator in a different representation is will be very useful when we talk about rotation in the following. Any questions? It's just basis transformation. Okay, <laughs> but we will, we will then use this basis. Uh, uh, maybe five minutes, I can talk about rotation a bit. So uh, angular momentum uh, uh, is a Hermitian operator. Uh, it's, maybe you have already heard about uh, the relation between conservation, quanti uh, conservation laws and symmetries. For example, if a system has time translation symmetry, energy is conserved, a space translation symmetry, momentum is conserved. If it has a rotation symmetry, then angular momentum is conserved. What is the relation between conserved quantity and symmetry? Conserved quantity is the Hermitian operator that generates the corresponding symmetry. That's the, that's the Noether theorem in the quantum version. So for example, we have already seen this uh, pre uh, appearing in the previous lectures. Like we say Hamiltonian is the uh, operator correspond to energy, and it is the Hermitian operator that generates time translation or time evolution. And momentum is the operator <laughs> that conserves, but momentum also, if you, it's a Hermitian operator. If you raise to the exponent, it generates uh, spatial translation. So the same thing happened to angular momentum. Angular momentum, uh, although now it is not a single operator, it is three operators. But these three operators together generate a rotation. And the rotation is, uh, is, is given in this form. It's uh, parameterized by the rotation angle. But you may notice that this rotation angle, I write it as a theta <laughs> vector, not an angle. Because previously, <laughs> when you consider rotation, you need to first specify an axis. And then you tell me, along this axis, how much, I need, how much is the angle that I need to rotate. So these two pieces of information can be nicely uh, uh, combined into this theta vector, <laughs> where it's a vector version of angle that the magnitude of this vector is really the angle to rotate. But the direction of the vector is the rotation axis, along which, using the right hand rule, left hand, right hand, this hand, right? So if theta is along this, uh, the sums di di direction, then all the other fingers uh, tells you what is the rotation directions, OK? So if you have an object that is rotation, rotating in this way, then you use the right hand rule, then that correspond to a rotation along this direction. And then that, uh, because uh, if you have a quantity that has both direction and magnitude, you have to combine it into a vector. And then the way to generate the corresponding rotation is now becomes very simple. You just need to dot product this vector and the angular momentum operator, just as what we do previously in our lecture notes, we all will often dot some n vector with the Pauli matrices, right? Which means that you need to multiply theta one with j one operator, theta two with j two operator, theta three with j three operator, and add them all together. The resulting operator is still a Hermitian operator, and that particular Hermitian operator will generate a unitary operator, which is called R. R stands for rotation. And that R unitary operator will implement a rotation by angle theta along the, <laughs> along the required dimension, direction. For example, if you try to rotate along the 0, 0, 1 axis, which is the z axis by angle theta, that means the corresponding theta vector is like 0, 0 theta. Now you can just, uh, just substitute that into the formula and replace j either by s for spin one half particle or by l for the spin one particle, you will get these two rotation matrices. Maybe the first one is still not very uh, like, uh, intuitive, but the second one I think is very familiar to you. That uh, if our chosen basis turns out to be the x, y, and z basis vector in a three-dimensional space, then the way to perform a z-directional rotation is to ch rotate x and y into each other. And then uh, that means the z component will remain unchanged under rotation, and the x and y will rotate into each other with this cosine and sine. 
and you can show that this rotation is indeed reconstructed. That's why I want to talk about this different representation. If you take this L vector in this XYZ re representation and then substitute into this formula, you automatically get uh, what I said uh, by, the, uh, by the exponentiation of operators. Okay, so, so that's, yeah, that's what I want to talk about rotation. We will talk about it more late next time. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>